uh, beginning in uh, about 2010. And what we've done in that time is that we've learned how to drive down the road at real road speed. And they're not 55, they're more like 80, 80 miles an hour. And, and uh, I'm sure we've been doing it with uh, gasoline, we've been doing it with, uh, with uh, diesel. But my heart says, my heart says do it with electricity because electricity is the only energy that I know of that's never going to run out because it's gathered from the sun. And it's not like petroleum, it's not like a, 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 a lead night there, <laughs> coal, it's not like wood. Um, the energy directly from the sun uh, is going to last forever and we, what we're trying to do right now, I think, is to figure out how you use the solar energy uh, for uh, uh, traveling. And the easiest way for me is to do with motorcycles because motorcycles I love and I know them very well. So I am one and I thank you people for uh, being a part of the, uh, the new fuel economy run. As I said, we've been doing it since uh, about uh, 2010. And we started out with kind of the same bikes that we had uh, in the 1980s, but very, very quickly uh, the fuel economy has been challenged and going to be taken over by uh, electricity. And if it's taken over by electricity, the next step is to get that electricity from the sun because it's free. And you people who are already uh, traveling, uh, living uh, on uh, uh, electric energy can very easily live on that energy from the sun. And when you do, it's going to be free. Energy from the sun, once you get the harvesting equipment, it's free. And because of that, it's available for a long, long time. And it's available under your control. So um, you kind of a rough idea what the current fuel economy contests are about. You have a rough idea that my goal all my life has been motorcycles that do more with less energy. But then the overall controller for that is to learn how to live on less energy than anybody else does. Today, that means to uh, gather that energy from the sun, which is never going to go, never going to wear out. And so there you have me. What I hope to have do is uh, I can introduce who I have at this end. But you can't, is it true you cannot see me, right? No. No. Okay. We, we, can't, we can't see you, but we have pictures of everybody who's in your room. So as you talk or hand them off, we'll try and get them on the screen. Okay, we, we were just trying to uh, do a video call there with live and it seemed to be working, but I had to cover the speaker and microphone because we're getting about a half second feedback. So, uh, so live, I can see you there. Uh, I don't know if you can see us, but... Uh, I'm working on it. She's uh, working on it. Yeah, we can see you on the, uh, whatever, you hooked up, plus your, I can see you on Skype, it's just the room can't see you. That's good. Well, that was Terry Hershner talking. Terry is... Uh, um, he's an electric motorcycle uh, 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 expert. <laughs> he came into my life about five years ago, driving cross country from uh, Cal, from uh, Florida, and I said, "Well, let's streamline you," and we did. And it turns out that uh, streamlining for him has allowed his electricity to go much faster and twice as far. So streamlining um, allows you to go much twice as far and much faster. Uh, actually, actually, the thing I can see them more than twice as far. Uh, my last run after I pulled the streamline, I went over 300 miles on a single charge on a 2012-0 with extra battery packs, but without the streamlining, I still was only been able to do about 100 miles at 70, 75 miles an hour, which is going to be more at 50 miles an hour, but with the streamlining, I could do 300 miles an hour. So, uh, we might have to do a lot more than just jump. Yeah. And also we have here Edwin McCall, and I told you Edwin can kind of put your head in here because it's going to like. Edwin flew out here from Florida about a week ago, and he's an extremely competent uh, a video guy. He knows how to All right, so we've talked a little with Terry Hirschner, we've talked a little with Craig Venner. Um, where do you want to go with this uh, conversation, Craig? Um, well, actually, what we have here is have probably the most competent, smartest uh, 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 people in the fuel economy in America. They're right here. And uh, uh, on this computer is, are, are some of the smartest in, in, uh, 
uh, Ohio are also some of the smartest. And uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, yeah. from this point on, is uh, invite people from the audience to ask, talk about, and or ask uh, questions that they have had about fuel economy. Why are we doing it, in case I didn't tell you? Uh, what's going to happen? What are the trends? That sort of thing. What I'm hoping is um, that uh, that they uh, feel questions that I'm probably not even capable of answering, but you in Ohio can, because some of the smartest <laughs> fuel economy people in the world are sitting up there. So do we have anybody in the audience that has um, questions to ask, and then we'll come up with the smartest answers there are in America right now. Okay, so questions from the, uh, the audience. Horsepower to weight ratio. For a streamliner? For a streamliner. Okay, the question is, what is the horsepower uh, to, uh, weight. to weight uh, for a streamliner? What's the ideal? Anyone on this panel want to answer I that? can jump in and say one thing, that what I've noticed is that weight is not the big concern. Your rolling drag is a small fraction of the air drag. So, um, yeah, the weight is more of a performance, raw performance issue. So it'd be more like how how much can you accelerate? Who, who are you going to beat off the line, or what kind of time you can do in a quarter mile? How fast you can slam on the brakes and slow down? Um, these are more of your your weight issues with the bike, uh, more traditional performance issues, but not necessarily as important in in fuel economy. Uh, the wind drag is the biggest thing, and so that's why you're seeing uh, what Craig came up with with the streamline idea. Um, so I would say that the weight, power to weight, what we have, um, and and another thing I guess I could add is that you, what you have with internal combustion engines. So the trend is going to be to go more towards electric, which are a lot more efficient. So electrics don't hit, really have like a power band. Um, per se, they don't have an efficiency band really. They do, but it's much, much wider than a gas engine. Um, so they have a lot of advantages on efficiency. But just to talk about the internal combustion engines, um, they have you know uh, defined power bands and they have defined efficiency bands. And so um, the way you get the most efficiency out of an internal combustion engine, and Craig knows this, he talks about the ideal horsepower. If you have a really, really powerful, like 100 horsepower motorcycle, you're barely cracking the throttle anytime you're riding it. You rarely put it wide open, you'll be riding a wheelie, you know, so you don't really utilize the uh, efficient range of its engine. So you're better off to have an, an engine that maybe makes, you know, 20 or 30 horsepower and, uh, or even less, you know, what he was recommending. Um, that you use more wide open more often. That's where the efficiency comes from. So, um, yeah, power to weight. Um, there's a kind of a, you don't want too much power. You don't want to have unnecessarily too much weight, but the rolling um, drag is, is much less of a concern. Only when you slam on the brakes. So you use some uh, look ahead down the road, you know. That was, that was Scott Hentler. And uh, I, I give some numbers. I, I, Alan will give you. Alan Smith will give you some numbers. He has a Ninja 250 that he rides, and you can get tell him some speeds yeah. that you achieve with that. Yeah. Uh, for for power to weight ratio, my bike's about 400 pounds with the bodywork on it. Stock's about 350 pounds. Uh, you do when you put the bodywork on, you take the old plastic off, so you do remove some of the weight, but but uh, you do add more when you put the bodywork back on. And stock horsepower is roughly 28 to 20, 25 to 28 horsepower, and at cruise speed at 70. I'm probably putting out 15 horsepower less on level ground. But uh, climbing over mountain stuff, it has plenty of horsepower to go over uh, Monarch Price at 11,000 feet with no, with no, no, no problems of uh, horsepower. If that helps you any, so. Okay, another Tom. question. Well, look, just a second. All right, Craig, Craig, Craig better here. <laughs> Let me add just a couple of things to what was just said. And that is, at, from this end, we, if we have learned that it takes more than 16 horsepower. 16 horsepower will barely allow you to run 80 miles an hour all day. 
we have learned that it takes one that's 25 horsepower, and then you can go anywhere at any speed that's, uh, that's way beyond legal. Uh, both these things are if you are truly streamlined. And uh, we have developed the only truly streamlined fairing in the United States, maybe in the world, uh, because we drive a little bit differently than everybody. We drive sitting up. A lot of people like to lay down. So anyway, I just want to kind of clarify, uh, figure 25, 26 horsepower and streamlining is not only the minimum, it's also the perfect combination. So I've said what I think is important. Okay, next question. Are you guys interested in uh, streamlining or are you interested in hearing, uh, say, from Craig Vetter on his recovery process? Uh, what, what types of things are you interested in? You came today, uh, the, the, here we go. We've got two questions. Let's start with uh, the gentleman in front. What kind of an impact do you get from um, wind turbulence on, uh, if you're on the freeway and you've got semis blasting around you, and, okay. and so, cross winds or another thing? So the question is, uh, from the audience, is uh, about turbulence and crosswind stability with streamliners. And Alan said, Alan wanted to jump in on that, Alan Smith. I, I, I can answer that because I have over 103,000 miles on one of my streamliners that I didn't bring today. and. Uh, as far as crosswinds, uh, if the semi trucks, are, if, if the gold wings and, and Harleys are getting bounced and getting off the highway, then I will too. But otherwise, I, I won't get off the highway. And I've had a number of guys that were surprised that I kept going, and they and they were they were ready to bail out because the winds were too strong for them on their big bikes, and and, and they were surprised. I embarrassed them, and so they, they kept on going. They, they couldn't they couldn't back off. But uh, if you get speeds, or wind speeds, I've, I've been twice I've been hit with. About 67 miles an hour and 70 plus mile an hour crosswinds, and you don't want to be out on that. No. It's, uh, it's scary. I, I got off the road as quick as I could when the wind hit me that hard. Okay, I think Terry, uh, Terry Hirschner wants to chime in from California. Yeah. So I, I also have about 80,000 miles with a, a streamliner, and similar to Alan, I'll tell you that uh, it's, uh, it's not, it's, it does affect you a little, but it's not as much as you think. In fact, when you have a tail and you get hit with a crosswind, what it actually does is it actually kind of turns the bike into the wind because it pushes on the tail. The whole bike sort of rotates on that back tire and it actually steers you into the wind. So although you have a bigger side area and so you're more affected by the wind, it doesn't blow you necessarily completely off the road like you think it would. You have to counter steer a little, but the whole design of the tail actually works in your favor, if that makes any sense. Oh, it does, yeah. yeah. He, said, uh, he said it does make sense. Yeah. Let me, uh, Craig here, let me explain to you uh, my end of things. You know, I have a very lightweight streamliner. But my Honda Helix starts up very lightweight, but it's also very long. It has a built-in tail. It also has only 17, 17 horsepower. So, but it's just not enough horsepower. Um, but the only time that I, the biggest problem I've ever had with that motorcycle is on the uh, uh, from the Mike Corwin's place here in California on a road that goes <coughs> east and west that has a maybe 40 or 50 mile an hour wind coming from the west, which means I get their traffic uh, coming to the east uh, that passes by, blocks the wind for just a second, and then lets the wind go. It's very scary for me because here I am going down the road, leaning into the wind, because that's what you do with a streamliner, you lean into the wind, the wind cranks up at all. And suddenly, a big truck comes by with a 40-foot trailer, and he blocks that wind for a fraction of a second. And when that happens, um, you are suddenly sucked over towards him, uh, because you're, that's, that's the correction you're making. You're suddenly sucked over, and just as quick as you suck, you were sucked over, you get pushed back again. So it, well, take, it takes me it, you know, a little bit of time to anticipate that, and yet, I can't quite anticipate it 100% one time coming back from Corbin. It was so windy that I, I decided that I was going to just pull off the road then because it was, it was, it was too scary. Uh, but then, uh, then we are done with that road and, and I was done with it. But I think Ellen has also had problems like that. And I hear Terry here wants to make some comments sure. on it too. One of the reasons that Craig's motorcycle had that effect is uh, Craig's motorcycle was a, a scooter. So most of the weight is basically in the axis of the wheel, very low to the ground. 
which is what perfect for what a racer going around a racetrack would want, because he can very quickly go from side to side. He can flip the bike very easily. Alan's bike is a little bit heavier, more of the weight is a little bit higher than the scooter, so he has less of an effect from that. And my bike had batteries very high up, very far out. So, so my bike would be terrible on a racetrack because I can't flip it side to side easy because the weight is very far away from the wheel axis. But what it did is when a crossing would hit me, I'd barely notice it. Where if all my weight was very low and very in the center, it could turn and flip very easily. So the far, further you are, higher or out from the, from the turning axis, the less crosswind effect. So I think a regular motorcycle with a streamlined bearing crank would have minimal effect where Craig's Honda Helix scooter, because it was very lightweight to start and all the weight is down low in the center, it flipped very easy. So he was very easily affected by it, where Alan was less, and I was probably even less so. I hope that makes sense. Does everybody understand oh, that? Oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. You, I mean, if you let me a crazy 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 crazy. <laughs> you know that. Uh, he, said, he said it makes perfect sense. I, I would like to chime in. I, um, what you guys are saying, I, I found true on my bike also. The weight higher up in the tail helps a lot with that stability. And um, the, the one point I will make is when we're designing motorcycles with streamlining, it is imperative that the design of the motorcycle must respond to the crosswinds, not the rider. The, the rider cannot be the person, the one who has to make the correction for the crosswind. That's a dangerous situation. You cannot anticipate what's going to happen when you're coming out through a, a group of clump of trees. The wind changes directions too quickly. Um, on the motorcycles, if the steering input's correct for the streamliner, what happens is it will uh, respond to the crosswinds and it clues you into uh, what it needs to do so that it'll stay on course. That's my experience. One other point about uh, the threat of crosswinds. This cross is Rick Valdez uh, making a comment. Uh, crosswinds, uh, I, I would totally concur with what everybody said. Uh, I mean, basically, I think probably most of us here would say that you know the same uh, wind conditions that would be uh, hazardous for conventional motorcycles we're able to tolerate because again because of the uh, balance that uh, you know uh, having a, a fair front and tail uh, kind of provides a self-correcting uh, measure. But I will share with you the most hazardous things that and the biggest difference is when we park them in, in yeah. winds. Because they're very prone to, to getting blown over with because of the large side area, so uh, we have had a, a couple of instances. You know, uh, I don't think, uh, you know either of us have you know had any incidents with crosswinds as far as riding. But I, I know you, 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 yeah, we, we've yeah. each had a couple of blowovers uh, from uh, crosswinds. So, so yeah. does does wind turbulence from semis when you're going down the road? I mean, there's a lot of just turbulent air. Does that impact the mileage? Um, the question is, does uh, turbulence from I mean, semis on the road affect our efficiency? I, I'm sure it does in the short term, uh, but again, you know, it's such a momentary thing that, uh, okay. you know, we just ride through it. Yeah. I, I mean, generally okay. speaking, I, I'm sure it would, because generally, uh, yeah, we, you know, got to make corrections yeah, or... Yeah, or across country, though, there's like the stream of semis, you know. Uh, on my streamliner, not the one downstairs, but the other one I, I didn't bring, I get it goes on reserve at 450 miles in the stock tank or or more. So the little times I'm, I'm around semi trucks, it it it's uh, it's in the noise. Okay. I, I get gas almost in every other state. Yeah. You know, with 450 miles, and that's and that's reserve. And then I still got seven tenths of a gallon, so I got another 100 miles I can go. So we have a, a, another question. I'd like to move on uh, in the back of the room. How crucial is uh, wheel size, diameter, and say tire selection, air pressure? I know we talk about aerodynamics, but that rolling resistance, okay. how, how good does that play in? So the question's about uh, wheel size uh, and rolling resistance, and how, uh, you, you are, is the nature of your question, how much is the percentage of rolling res uh, resistance versus aerodynamics? And does that, how much does that aid your mileage, say increasing air pressure I and decreasing tire size? Oh, and decreasing, uh, actually changing the size of the tires, and how does I, that? I can answer that one. Um, so Alan Smith will tell you as well, when you are when you ride a regular bike that's not streamlined, uh, depending on your tire and how you ride, I would normally get about six to 8,000 miles per tire life. Once I streamlined the bike, 
my rear tire would last over 20,000 miles. On my, my first zero, my wheel bearings would actually wear out before my original tire would. And the reason is because when you're on the highway, you're barely cracking the throttle. That back tire doesn't have to dig into the road at all. Normally, if you're going down the road at 70 miles an hour and you're you know, half throttle or more, your, your back tire is wearing very quickly. So you can actually decrease, if you're running like a 130 or 140 or 150 rear tire, you could actually decrease the size of that tire. You don't need as much traction attached anymore. Um, and, and your whole powertrain also will, will have less usage. So uh, does that help answer the question a little? Yes, it does. He said yes. OK. And, and Alan, Alan how, how much more do your tires last with the Streamliner than your old Ninja 250 did? It's roughly twice, but I used to get tire failure from something else. The tire, yeah. it wears uneven. Uh, I've had some bad castings where the tread wasn't even. And I, I took it in, and they couldn't explain why. You know, was, I think it's a defective tire, but I'm getting it should be getting du about double the uh, range on the rear tire. Unless you get a nail. Yeah. Unless you get a nail. Yeah, of course. So, I, so I, what, one of the benefits of streamlining is your your rear tire will last you twice as long, if not more. Do you increase your air pressure also to help the re reduce the, resistance? The questions yes. about the air pressure in the tires. Um, uh, air, I don't think air pressure and streamlining have anything to do with each other. I think I think whatever the bike would run at, your streamlining will probably add about 30 to 40 pounds, and, and possibly you want to go up a pound because of the weight, but not necessarily because of the streamlining. Okay. The rolling resistance. First. Yeah. I don't think he's talking about rolling yes. resistance. Yes, so that answered that question. The second question is about rolling resistance. Rolling, rolling resistance and aerodynamics are completely separate oh, things. The rolling resistance is slightly increased because of the weight okay. of hyperglass streamlining, but, but not because of the aerodynamics. No, I think it's uh, air pressure and rolling resistance in tires. For the fuel mileage aspect. Okay. Uh, do we increase our air pressure to get less rolling resistance? Right. right. Yes. yes. You, would, you would do that on a bike that's not streamlined or streamlined. If you want to increase the mileage on your motorcycle that's not streamlined, you would want to pump the air pressure up to the maximum. Right. It's the same. It's the same thing on the streamliner. If you, if you want to get your least amount of rolling resistance, you pump the air pressure up. But the streamlining and air pressure are completely separate issues. Right. So, okay, and we have another question. Similar logic. When it comes to that, are you guys running a hard compound tire versus softer compound, or are you just running stock? So the question is on the hardness, softness of the tire. Do we run different compounds, or do we just run I, stock? I've always run the stock tire. I don't know what Alan does. Um, like I said, I think they're, uh, that doesn't necessarily have to be a streamline. That would just have to do if you want to increase the efficiency and you run a, a harder tire anyway. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'd it, like to interject know. that. I, were, I usually go to a harder compound because usually, if I leave California and go to the East Coast and back, I hate changing tires. So I'd rather have a tire last the whole trip and not have to look for a, a shop to do all that and take the body work off and then put the, uh, the tire on and stuff like that. Very spare that. No, no, I don't. <laughs> not this, not this time. Uh, some comments about tires and, and rolling resistance. Uh, uh, for for myself, uh, you know, what what I've found is, uh, you know, I'll I'll inflate the tire to the maximum safe rating of the tire. So generally, it's around 50 pounds, and uh, I, you know, I I've found that that's you know the least resistance uh, as far as uh, rolling resistance for the tires. The other things, you know, as I look to the future um, for for areas of improvement for my bike, you know, I, I'm somewhat limited in my tire selection uh, with an older bike, and so uh, I, I'm looking to get a newer bike because, you know, then there would be radial tire options that should offer lower rolling resistance than the uh, conventional bias ply that I'm running. And, uh, you know, uh, other things to think about uh, are, you know, is, you know, disc brake drag, for example. And so, you know, making sure that your pucks retract so that they're, they're not doing. I mean, ideally, what I'd love to have is some drum brakes uh, where, you know, you can completely eliminate any uh, brake drag. Uh, other things to look at, bearings. Uh, uh, I, I haven't switched over to ceramic bearings, but uh, they, uh, Offer some uh, reduced rolling resistance, so that's something that you know we may pursue in the future. But we just try and look at things like, uh, you know, can, can you run a, uh, uh, a thinner greases and, and lubricants 
to reduce the rolling resistance. Uh, typically, in, in you know, as far as uh, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, as far as like wheel bearing greases, I'll try and go you know some type of synthetic and you know as as thin is still going to get the job done. But you know, definitely you know as you increase the fuel economy, particularly in a competitive uh, atmosphere, you want to look for every single advantage that you can possibly work out. Next question. There's uh, one in the back, and then we'll take the one in the front. Okay, um, this is for the future, perhaps. Uh, what about two up riding on an electric motorcycle charged by the sun? What kind of possibilities are there? What kind of batteries would you use? How could you charge that <laughs> heat up in the sun while you're riding? Uh, uh, Terry, what's up? Well, you can hear that really well. Not utilizing gasoline or coal or steam at all, or hydrogen. Were you able to hear the question, Terry? I think so. Go, uh, repeat the whole thing. It had to do with two up riding on electric. Uh, but, but go ahead and repeat it for me, Fred. Right? Two up riding on electric and uh, way with <coughs> batteries. How far do you? How far does current technology get us? Is it practical? So okay. range, And you can embellish on the question because I don't ask good questions. I just like to listen to answers. And, and then the and then the range. And then can you uh, just put solar panels on there and just have it just keep going? Sure. Okay. I'll answer all this. Ah. Back in 2013, I did cross the country on my zero. I didn't carry the passenger. Uh, I did have extra weight back then. Uh, my range was around 150 to 200 miles. I'm building a bike right now that does not have streamlining on it. It's a 2015 zero. I should be able to get about 300 miles without the streamlining. And if I added streamlining to it, it could easily be six, seven, or 800 miles per charge, depending on how efficient I make the streamlining. And I'm going to make it so I can carry a passenger. Um, even where we are with solar technology now, most solar panels are somewhere between about 18 to 23 percent efficient. Even if in a couple of years it went to 50 percent, for a certain amount of area, you're only going to get about, say, 25 watts for the size of something you could put on the bike. So charging a motorcycle directly from the sun while you ride it is, is actually never going to be possible, even if it went to 100 percent. It just can't work. But what we can do is we can have solar powered charging stations that you can go and you can charge very quickly once we get the C rate down, which is the charge rate that we can do. And we can charge a battery fully in four to five minutes, sort of like we fill our gas tank, which is coming as the internal resistance of the batteries comes down. Um, then it's going to be just like having a gas bike where you, you go for four or 500 miles on a charge, you stop at your charging station, it takes all that power that over 24 hours was accumulated in the charge station's batteries, and it basically blast charges you just like you're filling up a gas tank, but it's going to be an electrical connection that's going to be DC power instead of AC. So you will be riding on the sun, but it's not from solar panels that you're carrying on your bike. Uh, Craig, Craig, and, there here. One last thing about what Terry just said, and that is, uh, Terry uh, summed it all up at the very end. It's very, very important in the future to have uh, charge stations being being uh, powered by the sun, not powered by plugging into the wall, but powered by the sun, because that will last forever, and the fuel economy will only last 50 years. Okay, we have another question up front. On the gas-powered uh, bikes, um, are they mainly liquid-cooled, or do some of you have you know, air-cooled bikes? And if you do, uh, how do you prevent them from overheating? Don't so, this one. Um, so the, the <laughs> questions about liquid or air cooling on the gas-powered bikes, and Ben Sloop is going to pitch in on that one. Yeah, so I'm, I'm on my second bike now. I had uh, the first bike that I ran was, was an air-cooled 185. Um, it actually was it was right at that 16 horsepower. It would just keep up. Keeping it cool was uh, quite the uh, engineering feat in a lot of ways. It, it takes a lot of figuring out the duct work and, and getting the air into the engine and then away from it. So for the most part at this point, we're wanting to try to use a liquid cool bike if at all possible. Um, it's possible on an air cool bike. Um, if you were streamlining for 55 miles an hour, air cooled would be just fine because you could, you're using less of the power and making less heat. So that's, that's kind of where we are with that. Uh, Liquid cooling just gives you so many more possibilities. Um, even to the point where on my streamliner, I've taken the radiator and moved it out front like a car, and it's the hole in the front of the fairing just opens right in the radiator, and then you never have to worry about cooling. 
and you don't have to do any jumping. Okay. Okay. So also, we, also a comment on the air cooling because my first bike was air cooled also years ago, Honda CRF two thirty, and. Uh, it, 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 55 miles an hour, it ran fine, but uh, but as soon as you start pushing heavier loads, like 70, then the temperature, because I, I monitored the temperature of the head, it would really start spiking quickly. So at, at lower loads, air cool will work. Also, at Ben also used oil cooling uh, to help supplement the cooling. You need to do everything you can to, to do that. Okay, we uh, have about five minutes left, so time for one or two more questions. It's a question. Uh, hi, Craig. Can you see me? Um, unfortunately, well, we'll try and tip this here. We've got uh, Craig. Can you see the gentleman standing with the vest and the white T-shirt there? Well, they put some glasses on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and there's my dog Dakota in the back. We've been quiet till now, you know. But uh, <laughs> we saved the best for last. As you know, I visited your brother Bruce in uh, in uh, that. Madison, uh, Illinois, right? Or some place in Illinois. Well, you thought I can hear it, Jerry. What did I say? He said he visited the brother first. Can you hear I don't know. That's Frank Buckman, who I've seen all over the country, and he came to see me once in Alaska five years ago. It's an incredible driver. He carries his dogs with him. And he's just, Frank's just a treat to know. I'm glad to take the dog with you, Frank. I do as well. Yeah, you got your dog. You got your husky dog, right? Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Can, yeah. You, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's the name of your dog? I forgot. Charger. 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 Okay, yeah. I forget. <laughs> uh, I had one question for Craig. But yeah. Bruce was talking to me, and I asked him what he thought of your new Tesla. You know, with the gold wing doors and all that. You know, your your total electric uh, cross country uh, SUV. And um. What do you think of your Tesla? Your new Tesla? Your oh, I, I, oh, uh, you're talking about the car. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is a good story. My wife, uh, at Christmas time, I said, well, Carol, what do you want for Christmas? Oh, well, you know, I've got this favorite thing I just really, really like. And I thought she was I said, Carol, I will get you a Starbucks coffee maker. That's what you want, right? She said, no. <laughs> hey, uh, Craig, we're running out of time here. Um, there's a link that was sent to you that's going to be about uh, two and a half minutes long. If we could end the presentation with that, it's a, uh, a teaser for a, a new film that's going to be coming out soon um, about Craig Better. Uh, is there a way that you can play that uh, the video to the audience right now? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Before you do it, Craig, have you announced who won the contest yesterday? I, gas gas I, and or electric cost, cost per mile. Um, it has not been made official uh, outside of our closed circle here, but uh, the winner of yesterday's fuel economy challenge, we went 94 miles, and the winner, riding a gasoline-powered bike, took 0.4 gallons of gas to refill, and it came down to uh, one penny a mile, and that winner is Vic Valdez, he's sitting here right here. Today. Our second place was an electric. In fact, second, third, and fourth place were all electric. And uh, we, it was the Virginia Tech team. They, they were the <laughs> And we had a spirited ride. We took off on 71, went north at about 70 miles an hour for 11 miles, and then cut across to 65 mile an hour to uh, Worcester. And uh, that was the first leg of the ride, and we were um, our watt hours per mile were under 100 watt hours. Per, well, it was right around 100 watt hours per mile. So that's uh, world class. It's competitive with Terry. Although when you get to those higher speeds, uh, Terry has definitely the the best. Uh, his old bike was the best bike in the world. So for those high speeds. Um, so those were the the first and second place for yesterday's event. I'm going to try and find that teaser. Who did you, you send it to my email? Uh, yes, Ed, Edwin. Uh, in fact, Edwin's right here. I'm going to let him tell you where it is. Right. Uh, hello, Craig. It was sent to your email. I sent it like this morning, like uh, approximately 45 minutes ago. It says, it says uh, t uh, better film teaser and uh, password and link. It's a private link with a password. 
Uh, by the way, you guys will be, it's a world premiere for you guys. Uh, that was, that is not published yet, but I wanted, we wanted you guys to see it first, to enjoy it first. And it's going to be published officially with a website for the film in the next week or so. But we wanted you guys to actually watch it, see it, enjoy it. And again, if there's any questions, uh, we will take them. Um, all right, so don't worry. Um, guys, you're still there, and I probably it's only on our end. We're still we, connected to you, but you're not projected anymore. We're so, going to this other computer. So well, they don't see you. While well, they're looking for that, I can. I want to say something, one more to the guy in the back that was asking about um, the capabilities of the electrics. And Terry actually set the world's first and only Iron Butt 1000 on his electric, right. so 24 including hours. 24 hours at a thousand miles, including charging, so the one and only uh, Iron Butt 1000 for an electric motorcycle, electric Terry, electric Terry, yeah. Yeah, yeah. with his uh, Streamline Zero and with some additional batteries and chargers. Sure, do anything. He was able to get the charge rate up high enough to accomplish that, which is hard enough on a gas yeah, bike. The Anybody here ever ride a thousand miles in 24 one. hours? Yeah, we have one, two. So think about it. He did it on his electric. Okay. All right. So here's a teaser, um, and we are right at the end of our time. So yeah. come, here comes a teaser. The story fairing is a pretty remarkable one. The whole thing started in 1967 when Vetter borrowed $80 to start building fairings in Champaign. Ten years later, and the Vetter Fairing Company employs 254 people, owns 39 acres of land, is nominated for the Employer of the Year Award because of the number of handicapped who are hired, and is opening a warehouse in California. Craig Vetter is building an ideal in Rantoul. He has spared no expense. I know from history that when People can set an example, especially visible people, can set an example that other people will follow. If it's a good example, the world profits. If it's a bad example, we impeach them. Or coasted downhill on a motorcycle, or have you driven all the way to Cripple Creek, obeying the speed limit, and returned to check to see how much gas you average per gallon? Well, those are things that you can do this weekend. The rally got underway early this morning. Cyclists are competing not to see who can go the fastest, but rather to see which bikes perform most efficiently. That's Jim Knob winning the Wheelchair Boston Marathon this week in record time. When he crossed the finish line in a specialized racing wheelchair, he helped design. His partner was San Luis Obispo's manufacturing wizard, Craig Vedder. from the competition yesterday. They're out down at the bike base of the Goodyear Tower here. There'll be people who built those bikes. They're all custom uh, built um, by the people in this room. So you can talk to them and ask them uh, questions there. Any final comments? Uh, you got 10 seconds, Craig. Oh, oh just a second. We lost, yeah, we lost our audio. Try that. Now, Craig, you're silent and uh, um, and will we see him next year here? We'll see you here next year is what right. yeah. our comments sure are. Sure hope so. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have audio. We'll see you here next year, Craig Better. Thank you very much. I wonder if there's a way that we'll pick up this stuff. Just pause here. Go ahead, Scott. If there was a...